Hello everyone and welcome to this week's OpenGL 3D game tutorial and this week I'm going to be showing you how you can implement a simple lens flare effect. So lens flare is an effect that happens with real physical camera lenses when looking in the direction of a light and I'm sure you've all seen this before in videos or films but it looks something like this. And adding this effect into your game can make it feel more like the scene is being captured by an actual physical camera and isn't just a computer generation and I also find that it makes the light feel a little bit more realistic and intense. So depending on what kind of graphics you're trying to achieve, this may or may not be an effect that you want to have, but if it is, then this tutorial will show you a very simple and inexpensive way of implementing it. There are various ways that this can be implemented, including some more complex methods that actually dynamically generate the lens flare artifacts in real time, but in this video I'm just going to show you a very simple method that involves texturing quads with pre-made lens flare textures. Firstly, every frame we're going to calculate the 2D position of the light source on the display, and then once we've done that, we're going to take the imaginary line that goes from the light's 2D position through the center of the display, and we're going to render some 2D textured quads all along this line with the lens flare textures. When rendering these textured quads, we're going to use additive blending to achieve this effect, and we'll determine the brightness of the lens flare depending on the distance of the light from the center of the display. To demonstrate implementing this effect, I'm going to be using my little demonstration engine that I used in a previous tutorial, but you can of course implement this effect into whatever OpenGL or game project you're working on. If you'd like to program along with me during this tutorial, then you can download the starting code from the description of this video, or you can download the finished code and just look through it as I explain it. Before you can start implementing lens flare, you need to decide on the light source that's going to be causing this effect, and that could be the sun, the moon, a bright lamp, or anything you want really. All you need is the 3D position of the light source in the world, and you'll be good to go. As you can see, I'm using the sun as an example of this, and if you want to see how I implemented the sun, you can check out the sun renderer package in the code, but basically I'm using the same technique that we used when rendering particles in tutorials 34 and 35, to render a textured quad that always faces the camera. And in fact, if you've got a particle system set up already, you could probably render the sun using the same rendering and shader code as the particles. So to get started, let's have a look at the code for rendering the lens flare textures onto the screen. And I've already created the renderer for this because there's really nothing new to learn here at all. All we need to be able to do is to render 2D textured quads onto the screen at a given 2D position and we can basically do that in exactly the same way that we render GUI textures, and if you have a GUI renderer already set up, then you could use it to render the lens flare textures as well. So I've got this flare texture class here, which represents a single lens flare quad, and as you might expect, this object has a texture, a position, and a scale, almost identical to the GUI texture class that we had in the GUI tutorial. The coordinate system here that we're using for the positions is of course screen coordinates and that looks like this with 0, 0 in the top left and 1, 1 in the bottom right. The code for rendering these flare textures is then really as simple as it gets and I don't think there's much point in me going through this code now because I'm sure most of you are already very capable of rendering simple 2D textured quads but the code is fully commented so if there's anything that you're confused about just take a look at the comments and hopefully they'll explain it. And if you're still struggling, then I'd recommend having a look at that GUI tutorial, tutorial 26, because I cover rendering 2D textured quads in more detail there. I'll just give you a quick example of this rendering code working. So in the main class, I've created a flare texture here with a texture that I've loaded up, and I've set its position to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, the center of the screen. I've then created a flare renderer, and every frame I can use it to render the flare texture at a certain brightness. And if I go ahead and run this, you can see that that's all working and the lens flare texture is being rendered nicely to the center of the screen. So rendering the flare textures is easy enough. It just involves rendering 2D textured quads onto the screen, which we can now do with the flare renderer. The trickier part is calculating the positions of the flare textures and determining where on the screen they should be rendered. As I already mentioned, to do this, we first need to calculate the screen coordinates of the light source so we need to convert its 3D world position to a 2D position on the screen. Then we can calculate that imaginary line from the light source through the center of the screen, and we can then render all of the flare textures all spaced out along that line. And finally, we'll calculate the brightness of the textures based on this distance here, 
with the lens flare textures being brighter the closer the light source is to the center of the screen. So let's get started in the code and first off we're going to create a new class called flare manager and this is going to handle all of the calculations for us and it basically represents a lens flare effect. First off I'm going to define the center of the screen because we're going to be using this a few times in the calculations and that is of course 0 0.5 0 0.5 then our lens flare effect is of course going to need multiple flare textures so I'm going to create uh, an array of flare textures here also we're going to need to know how far apart these flare textures should be rendered and that's going to be the spacing value which I'll explain more in a second and we're also going to need a renderer a flare renderer to render those textures to the screen so let's now set up the constructor that's going to take in the spacing value and also all of the textures as many as we want and they're all going to be rendered along the line in the order that they're provided and I just need to set the spacing here and also the flare textures and we also just need to initialize the flare renderer so that's going to be a new flare renderer. So this spacing value is going to be the distance between each of the flare textures but it's relative to the distance of the light source from the center of the screen so for example, no matter where the sun is in relation to the center of the screen, we're going to say that this distance from the sun to the center is one sun length. The spacing value is then the distance between each flare texture in sun lengths. So if the spacing is a half, they would all be spaced out like this. And if the spacing is a third, they'd be like this. Because of this, the flare textures will obviously be closer together when the sun is closer to the center of the screen, and you can see here that that's exactly the sort of effect that we're trying to achieve. So back in the code, we're also going to need a cleanup method. And this is going to be called when the game closes, just to clean up the renderer to delete the shader program. And then we're going to need the method where all of the exciting stuff's going to happen, all of the calculations and the rendering. And that is the render method, which takes in the camera and the world position of the light source. And this takes in the camera because it needs access to the camera's position, the projection matrix and the view matrix. So if you're working in a different engine where the camera class doesn't have access to those things, you'll need to pass in those three things separately. So that's the camera's position, the view matrix and the projection matrix. So I'm just going to quickly plan what's going to go in this method. So the first thing we're going to do every frame is to calculate the 2D position of the light source on the screen. We're then going to calculate that imaginary line from the light source through the center of the screen. Uh, we're then going to want to calculate the brightness based on the sun's distance from the center. And finally, we're going to need to, based on all of those things we've calculated before, we're going to calculate the positions of all of the flare textures. And then once we've done that, we can render them to the screen. So let's have a look at that first part, the converting from world position to a 2D screen coordinate. And this is actually something that we've done a lot in the previous tutorials, although you might not have really thought about it that way. Whenever we want to render a 3D object, we have to convert the 3D vertex positions into a 2D position on the screen, which we give to OpenGL. And usually we do this in the vertex shader. So here, for example, in the vertex shader for the entities, you can see that I do this by multiplying the world position by the view matrix and then also by the projection matrix. They just happen to be pre-multiplied in this case. And this is of course something that we do pretty much every time when we're rendering a 3D object to the 2D screen. So we're now going to implement exactly that in the code. So let's create a method that's going to do this. And this method is going to convert from world space to screen space. And obviously this needs to take in the 3D world position of the light source and it's also going to take in the view matrix and the projection matrix. And the first thing that we need to do in this method is to convert the world position into a 4D vector so that it can be multiplied with those matrices. So let's just do that here. We're going to create a new vector 4F. And for the first three components, we're just going to put in the world position. So X, Y, and Z. And then for the W components, we're just going to put a 1. And now we can do those matrix multiplications that we usually do in the vertex shader. So first we're going to multiply the world position by the view matrix and we're storing the results back in chords. And we're going to do exactly the same thing with the projection matrix. 
We're actually not quite finished at this stage though, because there's one extra thing that OpenGL does behind the scenes when we give it the result of this, and that is perspective division, dividing the x, y, and z components by the w components to normalize the coordinates. I've put a link in the description to an article that explains why this happens, what it does, and all of the maths behind it, but for now, we just want to replicate it in our code to finish the conversion to screen space coordinates. So we're going to implement that in here now, but before we do, we're just going to check if the w component is less than zero, because if it is, then it means that this coordinate is nowhere on the screen, so we can just return null. It means that the sun or the light source isn't being shown on the display at the moment. And now we can do that perspective division. So we just have to divide the x and the y coordinates by the w component. And we're not going to do this for the z component because that's depth and we don't really care about how far away the sun is. So uh, once we've done that, our coordinates will be in this coordinate system, which is fine for OpenGL, uh, but for us, we want it to be in this coordinate system. So we need to do a bit of a conversion. And this is a conversion that we've done quite a lot in the past. Uh, we just have to add one and then divide the whole thing by two. And we just need to do that for both the X and the Y components. And that will now put our coordinates into this coordinate system, which is almost correct. Uh, but you can see that the Y axis is inverted to what we want. So we just need to do one more thing, which is to invert the Y axis. And we can do that by putting everything in brackets and then doing one minus. So we have now finished converting the world position to a 2D screen coordinate. And we can now return that in a new 2D vector. And then back up in the render method, we can use this method that we've just created to calculate the screen coordinates of the sun. That's the 2D position of the sun on the screen. So we're going to call the convert to screen space method that takes in the sun's world position or the light source's world position. Also takes in the view matrix and the projection matrix, which I can get from the camera class. Before we go any further, we're going to need to check if those 2D sun coordinates are null because if they're null, it means that the sun isn't on the screen anyway, so we can just return because there's not going to be anything to render. Next, we're going to calculate the line from the sun to the center of the screen, and we can do this by subtracting the position of the center of the screen from the sun's position on the screen, and that's going to give us a vector from the sun position to the center of the screen, which we'll use to calculate the flare texture positions. And we're now going to calculate the brightness. And this uses a pretty simple formula. I'm just going to do one minus the distance of the sun from the center, which is just going to be the length of that vector, divided by some number. I'm going to choose 0.6. And hopefully you can see here that if the distance of the sun from the center is greater than 0.6, then this part is going to be greater than one. And so the brightness is going to be less than zero. So basically, um, the brightness is only going to be positive if the sun is less than 0.6 away from the center of the screen. Next up comes the exciting part, the calculating the positions of all of the flare textures. And we're only going to do this if the brightness is greater than zero, because obviously if the brightness is equal to or less than zero, um, they're not going to be visible anyway, so they don't need to have their positions calculated. So let's now create a method which is going to calculate the positions of all of the flare textures one by one. And this is going to need to take in that vector, that vector going from the sun to the center of the screen. And it's also going to take in the 2D position of the sun on the display. So we're now going to create a for loop and we're going to loop through all of the flare textures. And for each one, we're going to calculate the position of the flare texture. And to do this, we're first going to create a new 2D vector, which is just going to be that sun to center vector, but we just need to have a new vector so that we can alter it without changing the original vector. We're then going to scale this vector by I multiplied by the spacing, and I'll explain this in a second. And we're then going to add that direction to the sun's position on the screen, and that's going to give us the final position for this flare texture. So we add the sun coordinates to that direction vector, and that gives us the position of the flare texture, which we can now set using the set screen pause method. So what we've done here is we've taken that vector from the sun to the center, 
We've scaled it using the spacing value, so the length of this vector is now how far apart the flare texture should be rendered, and then we multiply this by i, which is basically the flare texture's number or index, so that each texture is rendered further along the line. And of course we have to add this vector to the sun's position on the screen, as that's where we want the first flare to be rendered. Back in the render method, we can now call the calculate flare positions method to calculate the positions of all of those flare textures, and that of course takes in that sun to center vector and the 2D position of the sun on the screen. And now that all of the positions have been calculated, we can render those textures to the screen using the flare renderers render method. So that is now the flare manager complete. We can now set up our lens flare effects in the main class. You can see that I've already loaded up a load of textures that we can use for our lens flare effect. So now we just need to go ahead and create a new flare manager. And um, hopefully you remember that in the constructor we need to put in the spacing value first, and I'm going to go with 0.4, but you can of course try out different values. And then we just need to put in a load of flare textures. And for each texture we need to give it um, a texture and also a scale value. So you put in as many flare textures as you want, give them all different textures, give them all different scales. And once you've done that, you'll have something like this. And then you just need to remember to clean up your lens flare effect when the game closes. And we also need to call the render method every frame. And you're going to want to do this after you've rendered everything else in your 3D scene, because these lens flare textures should be rendered on top of everything else. But if you've got GUIs, you're going to want to render the GUIs after you render the lens flare effects because the GUIs should obviously be rendered on top of the lens flare. So once you've gone and done that, you should be able to go ahead and run it. And hopefully you should now be able to see a nice lens flare effect for the sun. So hopefully that's all working for you and you can now see the lens flare effect. Have a go at trying out different textures, different scales, different brightnesses, and I'm sure you'll be able to get your effects looking better than this because I only spent a few minutes on it. Um, you will notice though that there is still one problem with the lens flare effect, and that is that it's still visible even when the sun is hidden behind an object. Fixing this is unfortunately a little bit more complicated, and it will involve occlusion queries, and that's what we're going to be having a look at in the next tutorial. For this week though, that is it. Thank you guys very much for watching this video. Do subscribe if you haven't already. Have a fantastic week and I will see you all next time.